very pleased to be in out of my living room. I, I ordered a, a desk um, that goes oh. up and down, and Tom, and oh. the bathroom remodel got finished, so I'm I'm um, able to enjoy my, my dining room table again. <laughs> so this is right. my office and exercise room. <laughs> That's perfect. Yeah, I know. Oh. It's, it's fun. So are you going to do the standing desk thing? Yeah. Well, I'm sitting now, but I can't. Yeah, no, I got the full range, so it, it goes pretty high. And you can preset yeah. um, the distances. Yeah. Which makes it, yeah. I feel like I've arrived in the 21st century now. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I went with that um, and and I overdid it. <laughs> like, like all I was doing was standing. I thought, this is great. This is great. And then eventually, you know, I, I started getting my one of my ankles was hurting because I'd torn an Achilles tendon a while back. And it's like, oh, so, so I had to throttle it back. But I guess, you know, um, if I were to do that again, I would just sort of ease into it. So that's probably what I do, what I'll do when I come back in the, you know, in the fall. What, um, it's funny because on the dining room table, I had kind of stacks of books to get the, everything to the right height. And I yep. was standing, I was standing for quite a lot of the time, but, um, then my back went out and I started wondering if I had stood too much, you know, and, and so I'm, I'm try, it's actually stable now. So I, I'm trying to sit yeah. like the normal amount that I normally would have sat if I was at work. So. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Where, are, where know, are we in your house? Is this your uh, study? No. So I'm actually on campus in my locked room campus. and that's why I don't have my arsenal, you know, going. <laughs> Good. Yes. You're allowed to have your but, mask off. With your door set, right? Exactly. So um, I guess any, I, I, I'm going to do this from the lab where I'm going to do the demos. So mm -hmm. I'll just start heading down there. I can just take this thing with me and head on down. Well, it, you, gonna, you might as well hang out for a little while because it's, it, you know, we, we don't start um, the live stream until 5.55. And mostly, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, we're just, this is, this is sort of a sound check and making sure everything's okay and, um, and that sort oh, of thing. Oh, gotcha. Um, so, and then uh, I was going to introduce you. So I was just reading about your background. So you have degrees, mm -hmm. you have actually degrees in, in three different areas. First one is systems engineering and then aerospace right. engineering and then mm -hmm. mechanical engineering. So that's interesting. Right. Yeah, it's all control systems related, so it flowed nicely. There were some, you know, I had a little catching up to do here and there, but it was fine. Mm -hmm. My son is visiting me, and he's like, Mom, you need better lighting, so I have this special cool light. Oh, nice. So that I'm, but, I have some lighting from the other side. <laughs> ooh, ooh, is that your, oh, are these the masks that we 3D printed? No, well, they, so it is. Um, I was doing a fair amount of work in here during the, you know, phase one or two or whatever the heck it was. And so whenever I'd come in the building, they'd, you know, Bob Page would hand me a new prototype mask. So I don't know where this is, but it doesn't, the, this the, one doesn't make my, yeah, it, it doesn't make my head bleed like the others. But, you know, I don't know that this is the final uh, version or anything. So, so, so show me good. how it, show me how it, show me the, take it off and, and, all right, so you see that? that's the thing. Most so, of the things that go over my head give me a headache. So this, I'm good for about 30 minutes. And, and it has these pressure points where yeah. after about 30 minutes, something hurts, like jaw or, you know, like, yep. and it's hard to explain. It, it's very odd. But I'm going to put this on, and we can still keep talking, and I'm just going to walk. It, it's totally okay. fine. Um, Sounds good. Yeah, it's just, where where yeah. are we walking? We're walking from the which floor of the meme to where? I'm on the I'm on the eighth floor of my office, and I'm going to head down to the fifth floor. And okay. um, right, so if there's anyone here that's from Michigan Tech, they'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, let me I make sure so. I have my keys. Which, I have to change. Yeah, so we've got twelve participants already, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. And um, good. There you go. So you, you're. you're so at Michigan Tech, we're we're really working to keep everybody safe, including our important, not just our important students, but our faculty too. And so we are um, under requirements to make sure we have our uh, a mask or a face covering, um, such as a face shield. And so that's what Dr. Gordon Parker is wearing. And so we're in the meme. 
Yeah, we're in the elevator now. So I may lose you momentarily, but it'll kick back in if I do. Yep, sure. So, uh, Brian, how does my new microphone sound? My old one broke, and uh, I'm working from a new microphone. I hope you guys can hear me loudly enough. Yeah, I could tell it was different, but it sounds good. So, but I can I can tell it's a different uh, different type. Well, I had been just using my MacBook Pro's mic. I'm actually interested. You think which might sound better? You're pretty clear right now. So, did you just get it this week? I just paired it like ten minutes ago. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, it sounds, then sounds I, good. I had Danielle helping me test it to make sure it worked, and she's like, "I can't really hear you," so I turned up the volume. Uh, it's got to be better than, um, you know, just the MacBook speakers, I'd think. So, well, the audio, you know, it's not about the audio, it's about the pickup, um, I think. So, we'll see. I would think it would be better than whatever mic is in the MacBook Pro. But the other thing I'm thinking of doing is um, I have a, uh, my son is visiting. So, he's, he's upgraded my technology. I got a new iPhone. Nice. <laughs> He's like, wow, that was this is a four and a half year old phone, mom. Because <laughs> I offered it to him, and he's like, I think my phone's better. <laughs> Hello, Dr. Parker. So now, where are yeah. you? I'm in 502. So this is an undergraduate controls lab. Actually, we do a lot of things in here. So I can just give you a quick tour if you want. That'd be great. So. <clears throat> We see, I'll hold it up like this. So you can see some of the workstations here. Um, it's in a little bit of state of, oh, I don't know what you call it, getting ready. Um, and then there's a little robot over here that we use for some things. So kind of like mechatronics and that sort of stuff that we've talked about before. And I won't ruin it and show you the demo. So I'll, I'll keep you hidden from that until you know, <laughs> we get further into this thing. I want this to be a surprise. Um, but yeah, so it's a nice little room. It, Serves nice. its purpose well. Yep, and it has swipe access, so students can get access to it. Um, not quite 24-7, but pretty close. So it works out really well for this fall, you know, should we have to do something, um, you know, and, and have flexible access. So we could space students' times out across yeah, the... exactly. We could schedule them at 2 in the morning for their lab. <laughs> I think there's many who would like that. <laughs> I'm not one of them, but... <laughs> I know. There, but yeah, no, that's interesting. Are there, is it, no, that's very cool. So, um, so you, this is the last Husky bite. I think it's like singular when it's, we're talking about one of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we started it. It turns out there were 12 bites in total. So you're the, you're our dozenth Husky bite. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I know I was trying to schedule it earlier, but then something happened. I think it was, I scheduled for Memorial Day or something. And so- Yeah, I know, uh, I think that's yeah, what it was. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, yeah. It's, thanks for taking the time. I really appreciate it. You know, to prepare oh, a 20 pleasure. minute presentation tends to take 200 hours. I don't know, I hope it didn't take oh. that long for you. <laughs> no, it's not too bad, no. Yeah. Um, so tell me a little bit about how the, the format of this works because you know, I'm used to doing this for class and I'll sit there and monitor chats and you know, do all oh, sorts sure. of things. Yeah. So, but... so we've got um, Bryant and Sue kind of both as the kind of real, they're paying attention to who's here and if anybody's having a problem and there is a chat going on right now. Um, mm -hmm. And Jim is letting me know that he likes my mic, that is good. And um, that, so I want to know, is it better or is it the same or worse? Um, I can actually hear a little better, I think. Um, but uh, my son, of course, he was like, you need a mic. So I'm like, okay, I'll try to use oh, yeah. this mic I haven't even turned on. So, <laughs> and, and I, I mentioned earlier, he, he, he's, I have lighting now. So there's a brick uh, of, nice. I don't know what it is, but I'm gonna have to order one now. He took one look right, at me I and he see. goes, mom, you need lighting. <laughs> <laughs> I see those like, ones where they have the big circle, you know. And the, the yeah. No. High tech, yeah. So, um, so people can at any point enter a question and they, what they use is the Q&A because this is, this is not a normal like Zoom meeting. It's, a, it's, a, it's the webinar kind of format of Zoom, which allows us to have mm -hmm. up to 500 live participants. 
Um, and so people at any point can enter a question under Q&A and they can also just almost chat with us that way. They, they can like, you know, mm -hmm. they might say, who knows what they would, would say, but um, sometimes we're mm -hmm. having pre-conversations through the Q&A. Okay. And yeah, so I should update everybody. So I, um, I have, I don't, I have been in the middle, middle of a bathroom remodel since pre-pandemic. They were about to get started. We'd rearranged the whole house, you know, because both bathrooms being done at the same time. Um, and so the, uh, this is finally concluding. And so I am, I have claimed my office back. And so now we're in my office, which, which has an exercise bike and a nice new desk. So I'm, um, that's the, the change in venue for me. I'm not at the dining room table anymore. Although I might go back there. We'll see. <laughs> um, yeah. And so we, we have a, you know, it's, We've had a range of audience that the people who tune in, we've got, I would say about, gosh, maybe 75, like highly regular people who attend. Um, well, I don't know how regular they are as people, but they are regular attendees. And then we have, it depends upon who's speaking, like with mechanical engineering alumni base, there might, you know, we, we could end up breaking another record. Um, but it varies widely according to topics. So we had quite a few on um, and quite a few um, rewatch. science in my golf bag and that was through the MSC chair Steve Camp mm -hmm. uh, so and it's been interesting yeah no I learned a whole bunch of stuff that I didn't know about golf materials you know it, it's interesting that there's two things I think that people develop materials for one is aerospace well there's more than that but aerospace and sports are two really big ones you know where there's just sure. huge advances in materials yeah yeah so yeah. so I want to understand your career a little bit better so you mm. started in systems engineering, I didn't even know that degree existed back when you started. Right. So, so that was, I would say that it, they seem to be on the forefront of that a little bit. I, as I recall, it was something like electrical and systems engineering. It was pretty much electrical engineering, but with a mm -hmm. little bit more control systems than, you know, your typical double E degree. Okay. And so, and then, so from there you went to a master's in aerospace engineering and it's right. which is an interesting change yeah. so what was the link in common between the two oh i probably wanted to go into space or something <laughs> yeah i just thought that was cool right you were, know, you, and... were you watching were you watching the um landing yesterday i didn't watch the landing yesterday i saw some of the aftermath but i i missed that i usually yeah. tried to watch yeah some of the yeah yeah it's really yeah, no cool. we had that on we were glued to the to the video for hours. Yeah. It was pretty, yeah. You know, waiting for him to come out. It, it reminded me of, you know, back when we were seeing it in the 70s, I guess, or 60s. And exactly. 70s. Yeah. So yeah, I, I so vividly remember that. Yep. Well, and so then, did you did you go straight? Like, did you take? Did you work in between these degrees, or did you go straight through grad school? Right. Um. No. So I co-opted during my undergrad and then went straight for a master's. And, and really the reason for that was I really loved control systems. I realized that during my undergrad, but I also kind of like this aerospace thing. So I wanted to work in the aerospace area. So I figured I, I ought to have a degree in, in that. So, yeah. And then, um, so then mechanical engineering? Yeah, so then I did work for a while for about three years out in Southern California. Um, uh at general dynamic space systems and that was great a lot of fun launch vehicle stuff and mm. um uh then i thought well oh it's a long sorted story but but anyway my wife and i said yeah this would be a good time to do the phd and um so i went to state university of new york at buffalo working with dan inman and they have a combined mechanical aerospace department so i could kind of either go either way and so when it came time for the qualifier i had to pick Oh boy. And the job mark. Yeah. So I just picked mechanical. That looked like, you know, a more versatile degree. So. It's, yeah, we, we were, we were actually talking about that. Um, uh, that's come up a few times where, you know, a, a student will ask a question, you know, which better aerospace or mechanical. And, you know, it, it's very, these are very interesting career questions. Um, uh, yeah. And the, the answer is universally the same, like the sort of, 
get your degree in the more major field because mm -hmm. you can still do aerospace engineering with a degree in mechanical engineering, but with a degree in aerospace engineering, you're, you're kind of sucked onto the aerospace industry. Yeah. Which which does this with the economy, right? Like really, exactly. really significantly. And so like yeah. right now, yeah. people aren't flying planes. I mean, so right. you know, that they're not gonna be continuing to produce planes at the same rate and they're and that means there's a lot of people who are gonna be looking to transition to another industry, right? And and then often the way you do that is is with it with it is with another degree. Yeah. Yeah. So Yeah, exactly. I was just actually looking at the enrollment. Of course, I look at this every day, but the um, I looked up. So um, undergraduate enrollment is strong and steady. Um, online earning, learning, online learning mm -hmm. is up 43%. Wow. Interesting. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. And from what I was reading, graduate enrollment is up 11%. And so I think a, a, a big chunk of that must be the online learning. Yeah. Um, and so um, we have at the university a total of close to 1,300 first-time students coming this fall. And of oh, course, great. you know, this being Michigan Technological University, about 800 of them are students majoring in majors of in the College of Engineering. So in any one of our 16 majors. So things are sure. things are looking solid this fall. That's good. That's yeah. Good to hear. The provost just sent an update around, and it was kind of about the, and and so the the sort of overall summary is that, you know, what we're doing here at Michigan Tech is is we're adhering to the governor's orders, which you know it would just they vary over time, and so each time we adjust, but we are conducting. Um, our classes indoors and we have to conduct our classes indoors because it snows here um, with six feet of social distancing and with wearing, wearing masks. And so lots of classroom movement happened. So some smaller classes were put in larger classrooms so that the entire class could kind of fit. Um, some of the largest classrooms were moved to fully online. Um, uh, and all kinds of things. And so most students end up with a mix of face-to-face -face and fully online or remote learning kind of options. And uh, yeah. And so Gordon, are you one of the team that's been working on the ME labs this summer to make that happen? Oh, right. Not the ME labs. I have my own uh, lab that we're working on. Um, you know, for an elective class. And, and that's been interesting. We're going to change it to a little bit uh, more like a YouTube sort of a lab. So in other words, uh, students will watch the video, kind of follow along, and there'll be gaps in the content that they have to fill in. Um, you know, we think that will give us more flexibility in terms of having students come in at different times of the day. No, that's good. That's good. So we're coming up on the hour. Um, Gordon, do you want to um, make sure you can share your screen? Sure. And I will fire up this. Uh, so what I'll do is just share the whole desktop. And um, okay. And we'll and then, get the uh, presentation perfect. going. Good. This helps you go. keep me on track. Very good. So first slide. Thank you. Thank you. So we are now on the hour and so we're going to kind of go ahead and get started. Um, so we have 94 attendees already um, and it is 6 p.m. sharp. So welcome everyone. If it's your first time attending, this is the 12th Husky Bytes webinar um, uh, um, this summer. And so it's been going as along 13 weeks. Uh, we um, have been having a lot of fun, um, you know, learning from from 12 different professors here in the College of Engineering at Michigan Tech. My name is Janet Callahan. I'm the Dean of the College of Engineering and I welcome everyone. Uh, we ha I see a lot of familiar faces in the participants and I'm sure we have some new faces. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us. And um, thank you team. I wanna make sure I thank the team because we have, um, you know, Susan and Bryant who here help with the webinar. We also have a team behind the scenes, writing blog postings and sharing things on social media. So thank you, giant team for all the work you've done. Uh, um, it is it has been a great team effort um, making lemonade this summer out of lemons, you know, cause it's been, a, it's been an interesting time. 
So I want to introduce, well, all right, let's, let's go to the next slide. I do slides so I can remember what to say. So if you lose us, go to Facebook Live, um, where we are live streaming the webinar. Next slide, please. And I wanted to point out that the, of course, this is the 20th year of the famous enterprise programs here at Michigan Tech, which are multi-year um, teams, large teams, sometimes with 40 people on the team. Um, and so some of the teams are being focused, uh, there's, well, there's gonna be a new team forming focused on COVID-19. And there's a crowdfunding campaign to support student projects, but there's also, you know, people can vote on what they think the most important project to kind of work on now. So I, I just voted today and I encourage anyone who would like to, to kind of um, go on and go on and, 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 and vote your opinion about what projects we should be focusing on. Um, oh, next slide, please. All right, and so I'm gonna introduce you in a second, but I, I wanna, um, before, before we get started, um, we have a question from, uh, from Karen saying, I'm wondering about the prizes for near perfect attendance. I only missed one because I was traveling that day. So, so we're, everybody is gonna be getting something in, in the mail, so watch for it. Um, and, uh, um, and so the, for, for those people with passing grades, uh, who have attended 70% or more, not 60%, 70% or more, um, we were, we're going to be sending uh, you a, a, a t-shirt. So I hope you enjoy it. Um, uh, you may be getting an email asking what size would you like? Um, and so that would be from um, Danielle Davis, who's part of the team behind the scenes. And so everyone's going to get a prize. Um, we've had just a lot of people having a lot of fun attending and, and thanks again. So we're at 128 attendees, and with that, I do want to introduce um, Dr. Gordon Parker, uh, who is our um, a professor in mechanical engineering, and he is also the John and Kathy Drake Endowed Chair. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to, you know, Dr. Parker, I'm going to call you Gordon, if I may, but um, Gordon has degrees yeah. in systems engineering, in aerospace engineering, and then in mechanical engineering, and that was his BS, MS, and PhD. Uh, and um, I am going to leave it to Gordon to, to take it from here and tell us a little bit more about your career history and, um, and talk to us about math in motion. Perfect. All right. Thanks a lot, Janet. And thanks for um, you know, inviting me to this. And also thanks for the folks who are attending. That's um, pretty amazing. And I really do appreciate it. Uh, one I guess one more thank you. The, the room that I'm in is an undergraduate controls lab, and it was originally, um, the equipment in here was originally uh, provided by, by the Calders, John Calder and family. And that was several years ago. And since then, we've, we've um, modified some of the experiments and um, enhanced things a bit through the help of, of John and Kathy Drake. So I wanna make sure I, I thank all those folks. It it's, makes a huge difference for our students and certainly makes my life a lot easier. So I appreciate that. Um, so this presentation is on control systems, math and motion. Um, I'm gonna get a little bit of help in a few minutes from one of my PhD students, Sal, and I'll introduce him when he gets here. I'm in a room that is closed off, so I don't need to wear my, my artillery here, but once um, Sal comes in, then I will be uh, with the visor on, just so you can tell what's going on there. Okay, so feedback control. I, I have to warn you that I really do love this topic, so I get a little bit excited at times. And when we start doing the demos, I can almost, I don't know, I could spend hours just doing that. So I'll have to throttle back and, and Janet can certainly pull out the hook and, and stop me. But what we're gonna do is sort of the, those three main questions, you know, what, why, and how um, related to feedback controls. And then, as I alluded to, we'll have some live examples. And, you know, with live examples, there's always a risk of something very peculiar happening. So um, get ready for that. We'll see what happens. Hopefully it'll all work. All right. So just a little bit of background on, oh, was there a question or no? Okay. No, I was, I was just going to say, um, I can probably easily get lost. I, I have a true confession to make. Uh, um, control theory was the class, one of the classes that I got, uh, I got two C's in college and that was one of them. <laughs> uh, well, we're gonna fix that. <laughs> um, okay, so 
so this is a little personal introduction. Um, and, and there is a little bit of a method to this madness. So um, just bear with me. But I started out in New Jersey. That's where I was born. And then my family, when I was a, a, a little thing, um, moved my brother Doug and I to Michigan. And that's pretty much where I grew up uh, in southeastern Michigan. And I went to Oakland University for a BS and uh, University of Michigan for an MS in aerospace engineering. But all that was control systems. Um, uh, so it, it had a common theme, but I really wanted to get into the aerospace industry. So hence the need to get a degree in that area. Um, then I, I went off to General Dynamics Space Systems down in San Diego, California. And that was just a, a wonderful place to be. Uh, for a while, and uh, you know that I met my wife when I was in grad school in Michigan, but then we got married when I was out there in California, so that was you know all good stuff. Um, after being there for about three years, it just seemed like the right time to go for a PhD, so we headed back eastward to State University of New York at Buffalo, and and I suppose that's where I first got the taste of snow, and I don't know that. I was that enthusiastic about it, but it was it was good. But um, I was just there for about a year, and then my wife um, was able to get a position with the Indian Health Service in the Four Corners area, just smack dab, almost right at Four Corners. So I headed off there with her and was able to finish my PhD while at Sandia Labs in Albuquerque, and um, I was there for two or three years in that capacity and then stayed on for another few years as a postdoc and then a senior member of technical staff. And in that role is working primarily on you know, various things, including robot. Um, so for my dose of, of aerospace engineering and, uh, you know, after, well, I can't remember how many years we were there, but quite a few. Um, then we moved back to Michigan to to beautiful Houghton, and that's where I am now. So the main theme of this, though, is that all the way around this, it was control systems. And I should also mention, I was lucky enough to spend a year at University of Edinburgh, and this is a picture I took um, just a couple, maybe 15 minutes from the center of Edinburgh, you know, downtown busy city, just a beautiful place, and met some wonderful colleagues and collaborators there that I still work with today. So that's the background. Um, now getting into feedback control. Um, so what we have here is a, you know, a fairly sophisticated aircraft and you know, usually you'd have someone like a pilot flying that thing and they have some, some ability to interact with it as shown with the little cockpit. What we're gonna do in this slide is just go over the what and the why of controls and introduce sort of the, the, the main components of a control system and one of the key techniques used for analyzing and designing control systems. Okay, so this aircraft has a bunch of ways that you can make it move around. Um, flaps and ailerons, spoilers, you can mod modulate the thrust, um, all kinds of things. So you can imagine that the pilot, if they had to actuate every single, if they had to manipulate every single one of those things simultaneously, it'd be like playing a piano and, and that's just not gonna happen. But we'll get to that part in a second. We call all that stuff actuation and that's one of the key elements of a control system. So if you see something that is able to be poked by something, then that's usually an actuation point, and it's likely that you're heading towards a closed loop feedback control system. So I mentioned earlier that you know you have all these these control surfaces, these actuation points, and for a sophisticated aircraft like that, you're going to have some sort of computer that takes the pilot's commands and maybe manipulates them in some way, harmonizes them to apply them to the aircraft. Now at this point, you actually have a feedback control system because that pilot is acting like the feedback control system, right? They're, they're seeing things that are happening and experiencing things and then changing the inputs to the, the system based on that. But we're gonna stray a little bit from that. But I guess I wanna make that point that, you know, you are a control system. I don't know, path line or or something and close your eye that path. As soon as you open your eyes and, and you have some feedback, then you'll stay on the path. But we'll get to some more of that in a second. 
Okay, so the other thing that can happen to that aircraft, though, is that you can have disturbances. Something can smack into it. Well, hopefully not, but, but small things. And you can have gusts or just turbulence and things of that nature. And that will tend to move the thing, whatever it is. Oh, yeah, Janet. Uh-oh. So you are occasionally freezing. There's something going on with your control system. Is there anything you can do to make oh, no. a clearer signal? Are you, are you are you noticing that too, Bryant? Now it's good, but it was uh, it was spotty for a second. It seemed, oh, it seemed almost it's... not well. It's kind of been it's just it's we can hear most of what you're saying, but it's almost like when you lean back, we weren't hearing you. Um, so I, I'm not sure. I just wanted to you know challenge you with a you know improving right. the. You know, <laughs> this well, was a feedback. Was this not feedback? <laughs> it could be. Well, you see, so this is actually a control system, right? So, so you, you faded out again, just there. All right, you faded out. We can't hear. I've made it worse. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. So, Gordon, you've gone into Never Never Land but hopefully you'll be back soon. Um, yeah, so um, until we hear back from Gordon, I'll repeat a few things I said. So this is our last Husky Bites webinar for the summer, but we're gonna resume our series the second Monday of September, which is September 14th. Uh, and so we're lining up the next set of speakers. Um, and so Gordon's back and now he's a cat. Hey. Janet, I think I figured it out. What, what is it? Well, so part of the demo that we're going to do is we have a bunch of microprocessors that you can interact with wirelessly. And I believe that my computer was attaching to those microprocessors wirelessly. Aha. You're crystal, so was, crystal clear now. And you look pretty cool. Okay, so let me go back. Cool. So let me go back to the, the share screen. And we'll get this cooking. So now, so did you just turn something off in the room? No, I just went outside the room. So I'm far enough away <laughs> from those little um, Wi-Fi things that we have going on on the microprocessors. Cool. All right. So this probably is a good place to kick in, depending on where things were cutting out. Um, so let's see. Oh, hang on one second. I'm going to do one more thing. Uh, ba -ba -ba so we'll put this on and now we'll go into here and go to there. All so right. you're on the third floor of the now, meme and you just kind of wandered down down the hall? I'm still on the fifth I'm still on the fifth floor, yep, and just wandered down the hall far enough away from those pesky uh, control systems. Good. All right. We can hear okay. you crystal clear and it's not choppy anymore. Perfect. Okay. So yeah, you would normally have some sort of control computer there to help the pilot, you know, um, harmonize those commands. And, but eventually you're going to have some sort of disturbance uh, happen on your system. And honestly, this is probably the main reason to have a control system is so that these disturbances can be automatically compensated for. Now, you have a lot of sensing capability within the aircraft. So you can sense its angle of attack, the roll so rate, Gordon, all, all, yeah. Show us the um, yep. slides again. We can just see you right now. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's, this is part of my job. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought we had the share screen going. Let's see. I, I can't see it. Well, maybe- What are we doing? All right, it says you've started screen sharing and yeah, there we go. We're seeing a, a slide now oh, and now we're back on wow. slide. All right, we can see that slide now. Perfect. All right, cool. start from okay. there. We are good. So we have actuation, control computer, and then all sorts of disturbances that can happen on the, the aircraft. Um, 
And but there's a lot of things that we can measure, <clears throat> roll rate, angle of attack, all sorts of things. And so what we can do is take those measured quantities and bring them back to automatically generate the commands to the system, and in this case, the aircraft. We call that process feedback. And it seems really straightforward, but it can cause all sorts of heartburn. It can you know, create an extremely dangerous situation. This thing that I just mapped out with all the pictures is really a block diagram. And it's the starting point for a lot of control system design. And it's how control engineers communicate a control system to someone else on the team. Each one of those blocks would have in it all sorts of interesting dynamic equations. But we'll get to a little of that in just a second. Now, talking about feedback and its beautiful and not so beautiful uh, things that it can do, is sort of illustrated here. We've got this <clears throat> pitch angle, so that's sort of the, the nose up and down of the aircraft. Let's say that you co commanded that you wanted to change from a zero degree pitch angle to 10 degrees. And if you design a stable control system, you'll get this type of a response. If you do something just maybe slightly wrong with the feedback control system, you get this kind of response. And you know, here we have something that is blowing up and uh, can grow without bound. So this would be a really bad day, whether it was an aircraft or some other type of machinery that could uh, get into harm's way. So the main point here is that feedback control is primarily used for disturbance rejection, but you have to design it just right so that the darn thing doesn't go unstable. Applications are all over the place. Now, I mentioned before that you're all control systems, really, um, both internally and at the macro scale. But you know, when you look around and you see something that can be manipulated with an input, like um, a rocket that we were talking about earlier, you have all sorts of ways of controlling that rocket, thrust, and so on. Um, and if there are some measurements and those measurements are used to automatically generate the commands of the input, you've got a feedback control system. Now, here's the how part of it. <clears throat> We're gonna be looking at this system in just a minute for the demos, but it's basically a little cart with some yellow wheels. Uh, the wheels you'll see in the demos aren't actually yellow. And it can move uh, laterally back and forth on some horizontal surface. And attached to it is a swinging pendulum. Now, if you were handed that system, and let's say one of those wheels is actuated by a DC motor, and someone said design a control system to do X, Y, or Z, the first thing you would do is generate the differential equations or a model of that dynamic system. And the way to do that is to use Newton's second law and break the thing up into these little free body diagrams. And I showed one here, the green one, that's the little pendulum, lathered it up with a bunch of forces and then eventually generate some differential equations or dynamic equation model of the system. And you know, this is a typical one. Now, we're not going to go through all these terms that would be crazy and insane, but, but the point of it is that you take this sort of differential equation or this sort of model and use it in designing the control system. Cool. This is bringing, bringing back memories. Now, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry about that, Janet. <laughs> Hopefully, they're, they're okay ones. Um, so we're going to look at some demos in just a second. And I am going to try to convince this computer to not connect to those little microprocessors. Um, but what we're going to do for each one of those demos is the same basic block diagram. We're going to have this little cart. It has a motor. It takes as an input voltage. And we'll be able to measure two things. The position of the cart, we'll call that x, and the swing angle of the rod, and we'll call that phi. And the cart kind of looks like that. We're going to measure those quantities in different flavors for the different demos and combine them with the reference input. That is what we want that thing to do. Generate an error signal of some kind. Use these crazy differential equations within the control system that's implemented on this little tiny $80 off the shelf microprocessor that really wants to connect to my computer. Um, the demos we're going to look at are just a motor and cart system. Then we'll add the rod in. We'll do a little swing free, which is sort of fun. And then there's a big question mark for the fourth one. So that's it. So let me wander back in. Um, I am going to 
stop this presentation so that I can monitor the Wi-Fi more closely and point the uh, camera. Well, actually, I'm going to plug in a different camera so that we can look at the demos. Now, when I'm done with all that, I think, Janet, I have some slides at the end of the presentation that you probably want to talk to, I think. Sure. Yep. So yep. About, right? Okay, cool. So I'm going to go off of this. I'm going to look at that Wi-Fi. And I'm going to stop the screen share. I've got a, so, and Sal should be coming in here soon, but I'm going to get the camera going. Well, and, and so, while you're doing that, I, I just want to yep. kind of add that um, the, the mask that uh, Gordon is wearing is one of the ones that we've been 3D printing here and they've been iterating on a, a more and more comfortable design because the whole thing is um, if a professor wears a mask covering their mouth, it's, it's even harder to hear them and it blocks the sound. And so with a mask like that, you can wear a headset underneath it so there's good audio pickup. And some of the time you can see that, you know, their lips depending upon the glare. So it's actually working pretty well. I'm, 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 I'm kind of impressed by it. So, All right. Go um, ahead. So, okay. So, um, bear with me just a minute because what I'm going to do is convince my computer that it should never look for those other things. Um. Okay, so just bear with me. All right, this is good because I forgot to acknowledge our sponsor. So this this webinar this evening is sponsored. This is the second one that Dr. Bill Pradabon has, has sponsored. So thank you, Bill. Um, Bill um, Pradabon, Dr. Bill Pradabon is the chair of the Mechanical Engineering, Engineering Mechanics Department, which we affectionately call MEME here. Um, and so we are in the MEME building um, on the fifth floor uh, uh, with Dr. Gordon Parker. Okay, thanks. Um, so can you see that okay? We've got some little demo things going on? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so let me show you what we're going to look at. So here we go. Okay. So let's see, you can see my hand now. We have this little cart. Um, I'm going to show you a little close up of it right about here. And what it has on it is a little DC motor right there. And then we have a way to measure where the cart is along the track using an encoder. The, um, the control system and that pesky thing that keeps wanting to connect to my computer is sitting there. It's a little microprocessor and we can wirelessly connect to it. Um, actually, Sal is here now. So let me introduce him. So Sal, the PhD student, come on over. You can like look into the camera if you want. So there he is. He's a, a, a huge help and he's going to uh, wirelessly make all these things work. So let's go to the, the first one. Um, let me get a pointer up here. Can you see this okay? It's okay. It's a little tiny icon in my uh, screen. But this is the same kind of feedback control system that we looked at earlier. We're just going to move this cart about 50 centimeters from rest to rest. And I'll show you some of the disturbance rejection. And we'll play a little bit with the controller, which is this value of K right here. It's a very basic control system. So we have the cart. It takes voltage as an input. We measure displacement here. We feed that back, combine it with a reference input that looks like this, where we just change the, the desired location of the cart from zero to, let's say, 50 centimeters, creates an error signal multiplies it by K and boom, it goes right into the voltage of the cart. And we're gonna start with, what are we gonna start with Sal? K equal one, boom. So here's K equal one, and then we'll try some other Ks and, and see what we can do. We'll make it go unstable just for fun. Yeah, let's go. So 50 centimeters. Oh, it's still building or something. Okay. So he's uh, building it. That takes a, so through Wonka vision or whatever it is, you know, he's communicating with the, uh, the microprocessor over here and downloading the controller to it. And any second now, it'll be ready to go. I'll be able to tell because right now I can poke at the cart and it just kind of moves freely. 
as soon as that control system kicks on, it is going to not do that. Um, he's Sal is giving me various and, hand signals. Yeah. And so you picked uh, a value of k. Is that what you said? Right. K equals one. In okay. And k stands first. for. This is our proportional gain, but it, it's our control system. We're just going to measure the position of the cart, subtract it from where we want it to go, multiply by some constant, and off it should go. And Sal's, Sal's looking concerned over here, Matt. I'm not sure it, why. It's probably your computer still. No, <laughs> I don't know. It, it could be. It, it wouldn't surprise me. Um, but uh, so um, I'll give you guys a minute to kind of fix that. And I'm um, not connected. Wow. Um, so I want to okay. thank all many of you alumni who've been um, sending me ideas for for some topics for the fall seminar series. Um, keep sending me ideas. It's nice to hear from you. My email is just really simple. It's callahan at mtu.edu. And um, are you guys, are you guys, are you ready, Gordon? Is it working, Gordon? All right, I'm going to keep going. Interrupt me, Gordon, when you want to. Um, uh, all right, so the second thing I wanted to mention is if anybody wants to um, sponsor a Husky Bites this fall, um, please just send um, me an email or send uh, Weathers an email. So our emails are simple now. So Bryant's email is weathers at mtu.edu and mine is just callahan at mtu.edu. Um, hey, uh, go ahead, hey, Janet. So uh, Sal's trying to connect to this thing. I'm not sure what was that. We honestly tested this right before. But if you want, we could go to those last couple slides. Yes, yeah, have... go to the last couple uh, slides, okay. and I'll brief those okay. um, while you guys are working on that. Gotcha. Yes, yeah, so we're going to well, resume the series September 14th. And um, uh, thanks again, Dr. Predabon, for sponsoring. Uh, and so one of the, one of the slides we wanted to, I wanted to make sure we thanked all of the sponsors this summer. So we started the series without even the idea of sponsorship, but then we were actually approached by some people who wanted to contribute to the university. And the university says the best thing to do at this time is to give to the general scholarship fund because some of the, um, because the, the university has a lot of commitments to students that must be kept. And uh, um, because of the economy kind of doing funky things, the scholarship fund, um, does need some um, uh, one-time funds to help help us with this pandemic year. So thanks to all the people who contributed and, and if anyone else would like to sponsor a Husky Bites this fall, as I said, just, just send an email. And um, as I said, these, this is gonna support students who, um, who um, have been made, have been, have been, uh, are being supported. Part of their tuition has, has been supported in the form of scholarships by the university. Um, and I, we do have a question um, from one of our alumni Good. asking, how do we donate Perfect. to the design program that we, I mentioned in the first slide? And so I'm gonna ask either Brian or Sue, I wonder if you can dig up a link. So this is probably through the Honors College. Um, uh, they're running this, um, they're, they're, they're running a, um, like a, a, so see if it's out on the Honors College front page. And if you can find it, paste it in um, to the chat or something so that everybody can see that. And so we have a question from Mike who asked, how much does it cost to sponsor? And I'm gonna tell you, there's been a range of sponsorships ranging from as low as $100 to as high as, and Brian, maybe, uh, I know we've had at least a $500 sponsorship. I think it's gone a little bit higher now. Uh, I, yeah, and so there's no limit to the level of sponsorship, but um, Again, it, it, it's simply a donation to the university in support of, of helping students, you know, so that they can attend university. And so thank you, Bryant. Bryant found the um, link and he's given it to John. And so Bryant, do you have a way of sharing it? And Susan has now shared it with um, another link. 
um, to all attendees. So John, you can look at either of those both things. Um, thanks you guys for looking up that answer. If anybody has other questions to ask, ask them now because we can read your, your questions. Um, and so we have three open questions. Um, uh, one of them asks, and I'm not going to be able to answer that. We're going to have to wait for for um, Gordon. Ooh. But it's um, we're we're all good on this end. All right, back to you, Gordon. Oh, okay. Thanks for thanks for filling in, Janet. <laughs> Anytime. All right. So, okay, so we've got a K of one, Sal. All right, let's let's go 50 centimeters. We'll get through this kind of quick. I know this is gone. Oh, look at that. So that was 50 centimeters. Wait, 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 wait. Okay. Yep. Oh, I see. All right. So we're still see. You're still sharing screen, but we see it in your in in um. It's just not uh, large, but but that's fine. Gotcha. We can still see it. Oh, we can make it large. Okay. Um. Oh yeah. So if you want to make it large, go up to your upper right hand corner and click on the full screen. Uh, thingy. Do you have that? Okay. Um, right. So lost the, the audio for a minute. Okay. So the control system is on and notice that I can poke at that thing and it just comes right back to its home position with a little bit of, you know, a little bit of wiggle. So if you bring it back to zero, Sal, and let's crank up the gain to, oh, I don't know, nine. Okay, so we're still coming through, Janet? Yes. Ah, perfect. So we're gonna increase the gain nine to All right, nine. no, wait, hold, okay. hold on, Gordon. Yeah. Gordon, um, so I think what you wanna do, so I'm getting, um, a panelist is saying we can't see it. So I can see oh. it where, where your face used to be. Um, but what I'm seeing on the sort of quote unquote big screen is the slideshow. So I, You're I'm not it. sure. I'm seeing Gordon, like the uh, thank you. There, there you, go. you did it. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Sorry about that. Well, let's run the case with K equal nine. And so this is going to be a little bit more aggressive with the control system and a little bit closer to instability. Now you see how it has a little extra wiggle there. Now when I displace it off zero, it has this very springy like sensation to it. Um, and that's strictly due from increasing the loop gain in the control system. So a, um, you know, we're just getting a little bit closer to instability. So let's bring it back, Sal. And then, okay. So now we'll go to a really high, high gain, maybe like 18 or so. And try that one, Sal. And now it'll be on the hairy edge of instability. Now we bound what we put into the motor, so it isn't gonna go completely crazy on us, but you can see it just has this persistent wiggling back and forth. And that's a good indication that the system is unstable. I could probably settle it down a little bit by doing that, but then if I just nudge it, it'll go right back into that mode of persistent oscillation. Okay, so. Now we're gonna try to just go to this next one. Let me calm that one down a little bit. And this is a very similar to, um, control system. You know, it's got the feedback path in it, but now you notice that instead of position, we're actually going to be commanding speed. And we're gonna do two things with this. We're gonna run the same control system we ran on this cart, the one you just saw on this. And the only difference is, is we have this little pendulum attached to it. So you can imagine <laughs> that at the end, end of the maneuver, that little pendulum is gonna be wiggling a fair amount. And then we'll do something to make that not happen. So this is the type of application that um, some students and I worked with many, for many years um, with the Navy for trying to control uh, ship cranes. And this is you know, where you'd want to not have the thing swinging, be swinging too much. So Sal, are you able to connect wirelessly to that one? He's, he's working it. Um, okay, it's building, so it should take off or, let's see, are you, it's gonna start at zero and then you'll command it to 50? Yeah. Perfect. So when he, once the control system is loaded onto it, 
It's just going to sit there and then he's going to command it to about 50 centimeters, just like we saw a moment ago. And you can imagine at the end of this, the uh, pendulum there with a the little orange tag on it is going to swing uh, a little bit. He's almost got it. Okay, let it rip. Uh, so that's a, that's a lot of nasty swing. So now we're going to bring it back. Ready? Oh. oh, so the control system is still on. And so when I try to move it, it fights me quite vigorously. So he just moved it uh, automatically. So now what he's going to do is put in a very carefully constructed command that will cause the cart to move 50 centimeters again. But in this case, the pendulum is going to not swing a whole lot. It's kind of counterintuitive when you first see it, but it's a beautiful way to manipulate the differential equation model. If you have that model, you can bend it to your will and make the thing do what you want to do. So it's building. If I knew a funny joke, this would be the time to do it. Um, but any, within about 15, 10 seconds, it'll be downloaded and, and running. How many controls engineers does it take to drive a car? <laughs> Uh, well, it depends which ones. If it's me, oh, there it goes. Did you see wow. that? Wow, yes. So, so not swinging. Same basic objective, move, you know, in this case, 70 centimeters, but without <clears throat> any swing when you get down, when you get done with it. So now the last one, and normally I would sit here and play with these things and, and torment people, you know, with them. But, but since, you know, I kind of went over and things went a little bit awry, I'm trying to, you know, get through these so I don't keep people from their dinners. Now, what he's going to do here is implement a control system that is, yet again, very different. We're now going to measure both the cart position and the angle of the rod. And we're going to feed both of those back and combine them with the commands where we want the rod or where we want the cart to go. And of course, we want the rod to stay zero. So we're gonna say that the command for the fee is equal to zero. And the control system is taking all that soup, it's like this soup, it's taking all these ingredients and then computing the uh, voltage that goes into the cart. And again, the command to the uh, cart position is just this step-like function. And he's gonna let it rip. Is it building or? Yeah, good. Ah, OK. So we'll take so we another. Have, we have a question. Um, what software are you, you using? Ah, that's a great question. So we are using, <clears throat> excuse me, we are using MATLAB Simulink. And so all of the control analysis and design and implementation is done in that platform and then implemented on the hardware. And uh, now, one of but, our alumnus has commented live demos have a great history in the world of entertainment <laughs> yes right I, I knew this was going to you know i had this sense that it was going to be an interesting thing so are you connected to this one okay so we're going to build again it looks like um so you know in theory this will all look good we had all these wireless uh, microprocessors barking out their existence but everything in the world seems to want to connect to them um, randomly. So, so this is a good um, introduction to what we're going to do in the lab here in a few weeks. And we definitely want to make sure that the students don't overlap with each other in terms of the wireless connections. Um, so he, he implemented the control system. It ran. But now check this out. The cart moved, I don't know, 50 centimeters or so. And if I poke at the cart, it's, showing, it's going to slowly go back. And if I hit that, it's going to damp out the swing nicely and come back to you know, its, its home position. So this is a, a much more complicated control system. Um, it's you know, controlling the cart and the rod simultaneously. And now this last one is, yeah. I, I was gonna say, I can see why, um, you know, I was reading about your work on using cranes on ships in heavy seas, or, or at least not calm seas, I can see how this is related to that concept. Exactly, right. So um, that type of control system is very much related to it. And imagine that that cart is now on a ship and it's rolling and 
pitching back and forth and so on. And now you have to deal with that extra disturbance. Oh, ah, so Sal's signaling to me, he's gonna let me do the last demo. Um, uh, so I don't know if you can see this okay. Let me, yep. yeah, that looks fine, okay. And he's waving at me madly because I'm probably doing it wrong. Can you <laughs> give me a heads up, it? Sal? Are you trying Is to it balance live? it? Yeah. So when the control system loads, look at that. <laughs> oh! oh, there we go. So, so now he's got to kill it. So it's a, we'll do that one last time because it's actually quite resilient normally. Um, <laughs> and when it's, when it's um, up there, you can actually, you can poke at it. Let me get right in front of it. Are you going to rebuild, Sal? Mm -hmm. Cool. I know I'm blocking it. Um, no problem. I'm going to take one of the questions now. So um, Ronick asks, um, he asks the question, um, do I have a choice to do aerospace engineering as a major or do I have to do it as a minor? And the answer to that is um, you would, um, I would recommend you major in mechanical engineering and, 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 and earn a minor in aerospace engineering along the way. Is that correct, Gordon? That is correct, right. Um, there is a nice minor in aerospace engineering that you could do. Um, and that would be a perfect way to... Oh, Sal is doing some. Are there any other questions as Sal is... Yep, no, I, I'll take another question. Um, so I, I, I want to just reiterate, I've, I've had another 50 masks delivered. Uh, and we have uh, uh, quite a few more on, on order. So if you would like um, a mask, and I will, I will get one out of my drawer to show it to you in a second. If you would like a mask, send me, that is Callahan um, at mtu.edu. Send me an email with your address. Tell me a little bit about, about what you're up to. Um, you know, you know j just an update on, on your career or your retirement or your future career as a college student, just a tiny bit, not, not a long, not a lot of stuff. It's just nice to learn a little bit more about our Husky family. Um, and so just send an email and I'll get one in the mail. I have a, like a workstation in, in my office now. So I have a drawer with uh, envelopes and I just will send you a note and I'll, um, I'll show you what they look like. And if anybody got a mask that's way too small for them, I'm having a control problem on sizes. Uh, the first batch that came were a little bit too large. And so then we asked the seamstress to make them a little bit smaller. And so the entire batch of the next ones came smaller. And so now I think anybody who asked for a, a large got an extra small. So I'm, I'm definitely having some sort of issues with sizing. Um, so feel free, if I sent you the wrong size, that is fine. I'm happy to send you another one. <laughs> I so, should have read the label. Janet, as it turns out, <laughs> we're we're live again. We've got the inverted pendulum going, and if I poke it just a wee bit, I don't want to poke it too much. I'm a little bit shell, you know, a little bit shy right now. But if I poke it a little bit, it'll come right back. And so the application wow. here would again be like the rocket. Imagine that you have this rocket. You're trying to balance it first on your hand, and then you know lift it off into the sky. Very you know similar type of a problem. Um, if I were to poke on the cart, it's very aggressively pushing back on me. But just a light little tap here, and whoops, almost too much. Which um, could be like the wind on a rocket, right? You got it, exactly. So, you, you know, it's funny, if I didn't have the mask on, I could actually blow on that rod and make the cart move. So it's almost like a for force multiplier would be another way to look at it. Um, so there, we made it through the demos. I know, if and I had a teacher like you, practice. I might have done better in, in the, my control class. <laughs> no, you're, you're too kind. So there's probably some people on this, this chat um, that had controls here. So maybe, maybe they'll chime in on that. But uh, yeah, but thanks again. Um, sorry for all the ups and downs, but you know. No, it's no, it, you know, it was, it, was, it was great entertainment. Great Monday evening entertainment as usual. All right. so. Um, 
we have a few open questions and our tradition, Gordon, I don't know if I warned you on this, is we just answer all the questions until all the questions are done or until it's time for oh, Jeopardy. Good. Either way, you know, we, we, we end it. <laughs> so, um, um, and so the, um, I guess, um, I'm gonna handle the ones that are focused on um, control theory first. Um, so one, one of these questions is from an anonymous attendee who asks, how is the effect of nonlinear parameter effort limit taken care of? That sounds kind of Wow. Terrible. Wow. So uh, very good question. Um, the, the first demo that we did where we cranked the gain up and the cart went so sort of wiggled back and forth for a while. That was actually uh, the nonlinearity of effort limiting. And the way to analyze it, or one way to analyze it, actually I should back up a step. One of the things that you're interested in is what frequency that, that oscillation is going to be at and when it will occur. And you, there are things called, uh, or describing function analysis, you kind of represent that nonlinearity in a very approximate way, but it's still good enough where you can know if that limit cycle is what it's called is going to occur and at what frequency. So there are some ways, but definitely way f much, you know, fewer ways of analyzing those types of systems than we have for um, like the, the swing free pendulum. Very good. All right, the next question is from Walter, um, who asks, who says, in semiconductors, feed forward feedback systems are commonplace for the most demanding nodes. Can you explain what the system is and the differences with just a feedback system, if any? Right, so, you know, I almost draw, drew a picture on one of these um, poster boards of the feed forward and the feedback, because honestly, when you're designing a control system, you almost always have both the feed forward and a feedback. And the feed forward is using an inversion of the plant to calculate sort of the theoretical best input or the correct input to do what you want to do. And then feedback is really just there to clean up the slop. Um, mm -hmm. So you you think you have a good model, um, but it's not perfect. And so the feed forward is getting you about 90% of the way to home. And then you use feedback to, to clean up that little, little error stuff. Good. Next question is from Sarah. Um, how difficult is it to calculate the force that would take to cause the system to lose balance? Oh, for the for this one. Um, let's see how to say that. Um, so we we don't really have to worry too much about the calculating the force. What actually drives this system is similar to force. It's the, the acceleration of the cart is what causes the pendulum to do strange things, this being one of those strange things. So what we're really trying to do is manipulate the acceleration of the cart to you know, make it have these behaviors like balancing the pendulum. So we, we really don't even have to calculate force. So I guess, you know, we're off the hook mm -hmm. on that one. It could probably be inferred somehow through massive oh. amounts of differential equations. <laughs> oh yeah, you could, you could certainly calculate it, but you know, um, and we can actually calculate it from the motor because we know how much current we're putting through the motor. Um, and we know the motor's torque constant, so we could actually back out how much force is being applied to the cart at the, uh, at the track. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. All right, John asks, um, what role has Michigan Tech been playing in terms of developing technologies or algorithms in support of autonomous driving, which I hope will be available before people want to take my car keys from me? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> um, Me too. <laughs> I okay. I'm probably not the 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 best person to ask on that. However, there are several people on campus working in that space. So Jeremy Boss, the folks who are working with Jeff Neighbor on some things, and Daryl Robinette. There there's several and working it in. I think you know both from a sensor and an algorithmic standpoint. And which also obviously brings in the controls. So there's there's a hub of activity there. 
there is, and Jeremy Boz was one of our speakers earlier in the year who, um, ha, uh, who oversees one of the uh, enterprise programs um, and their, their focus, their main focus is on um, the, uh, uh, what is it called, the Borealis? Is that the right name? Um, which is our, you know, our, we were one of the, a, a set of teams from universities invited to participate in a competition and we've been doing rather well on a very tiny little budget. So if anybody wants to contribute to that enterprise, I know that Jeremy's looking for sponsors for that now. All right, this is a question about the chemical industry. Working on process control in the chemical industry for some decades, I found that things like feed forward control, nonlinear gains like parabolic control and so on were often much more effective than standard PID control. While process models are fine, the real world of sticky control services like valves, operations outside the original design, equipment changes, et cetera, often put paid to all these differential equations. Absolutely true. Yeah, <laughs> no doubt. Um, now, I'm, you know, I don't do a whole lot of work in the process control area, but um, quite a bit of work with electrohydraulic systems. And, you know, we would have differential equation models of those hydraulic systems, but the reality of large, uh, let's see, what should we call them? Um, not quite industrial grade hydraulics were similar, I think, to your sticky valves, you know, lots of, of um, proportional valves and all kinds of crazy things. And, you know, the differential equations would get you maybe in the ballpark, but then, you know, you'd have to do something more creative, no doubt. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and um, so, you know, at this, at this time, lots of people sort of peter out and trickle away. And before that tends to happen, I always want to thank everybody one more time for coming. So we still have 116 attendees. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, many of you have been with us most of the summer. You guys rock. Um, you have made it kind of living through this pandemic much more fun on a Monday evening for me. So thank you everyone. And we're going to stick around and kind of answer all these questions. So, and also Gordon, would please extend our thanks to your student for helping us out this evening. Um, I will. Nice. So my, uh, yeah. So Sal, look at that. there you go, Sal. Thank you, Sal. <laughs> yeah, Sal's great. So, and, um, so Sal, if, if you head out of the room, then I can pull this thing off and I, I can fiddle around with that. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, and I want to thank everyone too for for uh, attending and you know muscling through this. We had a little bit of um, Wi-Fi fun, but that's oh, I'm yeah. sure well, you know, had a little of that. Yeah, we had we had a, a pair of hurdles, but no, this is a, this is like you know what what we are what we do we problem solve. So yeah. there you have it. Yeah. Happy to be able to provide the feedback that we couldn't hear you and things like that. So yep. all right, the next the next question is from Thomas. Uh, could the feedback system used to limit pendulum swing be somehow used for building stability in earthquake prone areas? Or does the amount and direction of motion need to be a known factor? Excellent question. Yeah, um, I mean, they're all good questions, but yeah, you hit the nail on the head. You kind of have to know where you want to go and then create that profile in advance. So it's a little bit of a cheat, but you know, if you had to do a repeated motion over and over again, which would be a repeated motion, um, then it's a great way to go. Very good. This is from Walter. My brother was a carrier pilot. Can control systems mm. like this help match the carrier motion to mm. the plane, to the landing plane? I, I you know, um, so actually moving the carrier is a pretty tough thing to do, um, but uh, we have worked with the Navy on um, sort of secondary platforms that things can land on, not necessarily fighter aircraft, but more like um, vertical takeoff and landing type craft or um, landing things like loads coming off a crane onto a stabilized platform. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's definitely a thing. All right, just a classroom question. Dr. Parker, I read that you use something called a flipped classroom when you teach. What is a flipped classroom? Do you stand on your hands or something? <laughs> I do, yes, <laughs> and juggle with my feet. No, um, so um, 
let's see, how to describe that? It, it, you know, there's different, you can think of it like a rainbow, you know, there's different extreme, different levels of, of that. But basically what I do is try to get some content out ahead of time and ask students to read it, maybe answer a few questions on it. And then we can spend more time in class working the problems or, you know, addressing uh, student questions and discussion. Um, it doesn't, you know, that isn't, doesn't work that way 100% of the time, but, um, you know, a fair amount. Well, and the whole idea is to do pre-work before coming to class so that when, when you have, so that the professor can spend their time really actively helping um, with the sticky parts, the more difficult parts to understand. So getting through the easier or the sort of more comprehensible stuff ahead of time. And then, um, yeah, no, it's, it's actually a really well-known um, method of teaching. Now, and no wonder you, you've been received the uh, provost's uh, new award for uh, being Ooh. consistently nominated for, for <laughs> excellent teaching. So this next Thanks. question is from Michael. In real world applications, do you use finite difference models rather than differential equations? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, so, and yeah, great observation. Um, the differential equations, of course, are continuous time. These, everything you just saw is implemented on a, on a microprocessor. And so to make that happen, um, you definitely, those systems have been discretized. So instead of, you know, X double dot, we have things like X plus one equals blah, blah, blah. So we turn into a difference equation and off we go. Yeah, absolutely. Very good. This next question is from Ross. Um, aerospace is only available as a minor, but you can enhance that by doing the aerospace enterprise for senior design working with satellites. So I think Ross Hogan mm. is one of our advisors answering um, an earlier question. So that's true. No, I, that's a really good point to bring up. The aerospace enterprise um, is was actually see, um, discussed um, earlier in the semester. That, I believe that was our, gosh, when, which, which one was that? It was um, by... Um, was that who, Brad? It was Brad. Yeah, it was, it was Brad yep. King. Uh, and so you might take a look at that, um, the webinar by Brad King, uh, if you're interested in aerospace and sign up for the aerospace enterprise. It's awesome. All right, the next question is from Anonymous. What industries do controls engineers get to work in when they graduate? Are there options in uh, biomedical engineering for the expertise? Yes. Yeah, definitely. Um, so one of the nice things, and this is my plug for control systems, is that if you're known as the control systems person, then you can kind of, you know, weave in and out of the economy and, you know, get into different fields that you're interested in. Uh, biomedical definitely has a lot of controls uh, folks in it. I had a student in a class in the spring who was a biomedical engineer and she had, um, she identified these parallels between what she was doing and what, you know, the controls -y stuff we were doing. So very, very good. Um, I, if I digress for just a minute, there's this other uh, area specialty called systems biology, which is trying to take kind of a dynamic, a modeling and controls perspective to um, biology. And that's a whole nother, it's not really biomedical, but it's a different way of looking at biological systems. And I think that's going to be a very important area in the future, because if you can control at the cellular level, there's, you know, you can do great things. You can also do a lot of mischief, but you can do a lot of great things. All right, and this next question asks, what is the most challenging controls problem you've ever tackled? Except besides the one today, you know, this was <laughs> right up there. <laughs> uh, in terms of unexpected. Um, uh, yeah, so it, it's a recent one and um, see how to describe it quickly. So there's a lot of systems now that have massive electrical and thermal loads. So to, in other words, to actuate a thing, you have to provide it many megajoules of energy and that tends to heat the thing up. And so now it's kind of like the pendulum cart problem. You have two things that you're trying to control, this electrical power surge and also the heating of the thing. And um, a lot of times you have to dissipate that heat quickly. 
it's a it's a ridiculously hard problem to solve and um you know i think you just hit some some fundamental limits of physics you know once you you, you get into it so definitely that's probably it Oh, so oh, we should have. I should have been able to read this earlier. Um, this Kincaid w wanted you to lean the table, like tilt the table up, and do the control thing. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I was planning on doing that, Kincaid. So, you know, if I hadn't been sort of rushed near the end, I was going to do exactly that because it's a beautiful disturbance when you tip the table up, and we can actually do it with the inverted pendulum. You can take the table, lift it up a little bit, maybe you know an inch or two, and the thing will just stay there and be happy as a clam. That's pretty cool. Now you just have to. We'll take have to have a. It, we'll have to have a do over or something like that, or a, we'll, we'll have you back. Hey, you know, honestly, if anyone is interested in this sort of thing, I love this sort of stuff, and you know, get a hold of me, and and we have this hardware here, and it's easy. It really is pretty easy to whip up. So if someone wants to see something, just let me know. All right, um, and then Merle um, uh, states that the vertical rod is in the XY plane. How about the XYZ plane, like a rocket? <laughs> oh, yeah, well, it's a little harder. <laughs> so, um, the, the, okay, so um, what you have with the rocket that's different here is you have actuation that allows you to, you know, do all, well, you know, so you can gimbal rocket engines so that you can have that type of motion or control authority. We just don't have that with the cart. All we can do is is move the cart back and forth. So we're kind of stuck with what we have. Yep. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. So uh, in your research group, you're you're handling three dimensional problems. I'm sure. Oh, definitely. So, yeah. Um, yeah. All right, this is a great question. Um, uh, how do you get through controls as an undergraduate if math is not your absolute strong point? So I'm gonna take a stab at answering that. So my, I mentioned having earned two C's as an undergraduate. So my, 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 my grades in math went, and you, you, there's sort of four math classes you must take. Calculus one, calculus two, uh, what's the third one? Um, what is it called? multivariate calculus oh. or something like that yeah, third one. and right. then the, the yeah. fourth one is differential equations right and if if you get through all four of them you're going to be an engineer right so my grades in these things went a a minus b c and i was just really glad that, that i'd hit the end of it but but c in differential <laughs> equations was an exact corollary to how i did in control theory because it's applied differential equations and you know right. i i needed to study harder or 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 I don't know. I needed to, I just, it wasn't easy for me, but I got through it and I became an engineer. So, you, you know, I guess my answer to that is you just got to get through it and you may not be, be, a, be somebody like Dr. Parker and, and make this your, your specialty field, you know, but if you can get through it, you, you know, you're going to, you're going to be an engineer. And do you want to add anything, Gordon? Yeah. Just a, a couple things, you know, I think for, I, I, I truly believe that if you get to that point, you know, through some of those classes that you just described, if you really wanted to, to you know, hone your skills enough to, to master controls, you could do it. There's a thing that happens in controls that I didn't cover here, where you, you start with a dynamic system that's very physical, and then it becomes extremely abstract mathematically. And what you have to do, in my opinion, is, is embrace that and free yourself you know, you just have to say, okay, I, I don't, I can't touch this abstraction, but I'm just going to have to jump off the diving board yeah. and believe that there's water underneath. And then we get back to the physical aspect of it after we unwrap all that abstraction. So there's a little bit of faith, I guess, required, um, but I, I, I believe it's okay. I think Talk if I your... had a teacher like you, I would have been fine. <laughs> uh, <I don't> <laughs> Thanks. All right. The next question is from, from Pranav, or I'm not sure I'm saying your yeah. name right. I apologize. What software or softwares can be used to prototype these kinds of setups? Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, like I said, you know, we were using MATLAB Simulink here. And if you're, if you are a student at Tech, you have open access to a massive MATLAB Simulink license, mm -hmm. truly a massive license. And you can install it on your home computer and, you know, use it in any way you want. Um, uh, it's an incredible thing. Um, 
so if you're a student, then you have access to that. If you're not, then you had likely best get comfortable with things like C programming. And then you can, you know, write these, you can code these algorithms in C and download them to the CPU, um, you know, in sort of a brute force manner. And we've done a ton of that kind of work um, over the years, just because of the people we were working with didn't have the tools in MATLAB Simulink. Well, and, and um, so just, just to kind of elaborate on that a little bit. So it's not just that, that particular software, but we have, I don't know, 100 or 200 wow. whole bunch of software that uh, as a Michigan Tech student, you have full access to um, uh, and an incredible IT support team to help with when, you know, with installing these on your computer and, 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 and that sort of thing. So it's one of the huge perks of being a Michigan Tech student um, because um, there are, are it, well, we have so many engineers, we have just site licenses for pretty, pretty much everything that, um, that you can imagine. All right, this next question um, says, when would you use a PLC to implement a control system and when would you use a microprocessor? Oh, that's good. So those lines are becoming blurred with time. You know, in, in you know, I don't want to sound like some, you know, like ancient or whatever, but I did PLC programming many, many years ago. And at that time, you know, it was the ladder logic stuff. And you're, you're basically kind of doing relay type control, you know, switching things on and off. Um, the, the distinction between PLCs and these types of microcontrollers that you're looking at today are, are becoming much, much blurrier. And so um, we could actually implement a PLC controller on, on this system to some extent, you know, limited number of channels and so forth um, without too much trouble. So, but I, I, maybe to answer your question, you know, if, if what you're doing is sort of a switching thing, you know, on, off, you know, do this, do that, then definitely, you know, PLC type thing is, is the way to go. It stands for proportional linear, linear control? Uh, programmable logic controller. Yeah. <laughs> you see what yeah, I know about that's all right. Because because there's PID, which is the proportional integral derivative control, which is okay. probably okay. what a lot of folks, yeah, have seen. Yeah. Yep. No, we we use acronyms. That's what engineers do. Uh, you know. All right. Um, this question asks: I saw some videos where the rod was swinged up from rest. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, yes. And then, did. <laughs> how can we uh, do that? Yeah, we can do that. So um, we do that every once in a while for different demos and stuff. We chose not to do it today. We didn't even test it, but you know, ahead of time, we did honestly, as I said before, test all these things, but we had some strange connections just now. Um, but what happens is, is you basically have two different control systems. What you do is you have one control system that's just moving the cart back and forth at a certain frequency that excites the natural frequency of the rod. And so by doing that, you can build up the motion of the rod and it you know, starts out like this and it gets up higher and higher and eventually it gets to close to 180 and then you switch controllers to the one that you saw earlier and you, know, you, you snatch it. Um, it. It works most of the time. You have to work a little bit on making sure that there's not too much sag in the, in the uh, track because that can, can even, uh, you know, it might not be visual, but it can cause some heartburn with that solution. <laughs> well, you know, and we we, ha we still have 11 open questions. We've answered 25, but I want to, I don't, I, again, I haven't previewed all those questions, but um, I wanted to point out like one of the funnest things to watch is uh, is a demo of the wave tank, um, which, it, which is in the bottom floor of the meme building. Uh, it's an enormous tank um, full of water and you guys can program it to make a, Oh, to do almost anything, right? I mean, to be yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, it it is, and I think there's a picture somewhere, um, you know, uh, associated with this uh, presentation. But um, yeah, and so that's another one of my my little facilities where we do uh, control studies for wave energy converters, and we can uh, make you know, very versatile wave fields. And one of the nice things about the wave tank is it has, um, I would call sort of a state of the art instrumentation package. So we can, we have 11 cameras that are constantly imaging the, the wave tank area. 
And just like you maybe have seen athletes lathered up with the little markers and you can track their motions, maybe in Hollywood mm -hmm. movies and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, we can do that with the objects in the tank and measure down to extremely um, uh, fine resolution. So great fun. Yeah. Yeah. And that facility is actually available as a research facility. So someone who needs access to a wave tank could come in and um, mm -hmm. use it for a user's fee. Uh, and so just kind of be aware. It's, it's one of, it's a very nice facility, um, state of the art. Yeah. All right, we're going to go to the next question. How many engineers do you typically have working on a control system design and how long do you spend on development, characterization, simulation, et cetera? Oh my gosh. Yeah, that, that's a, you know, that certainly depends on the project. It, from my experience, you know, from working outside of academia, it kind of depends on is this a one-off thing? Is, is this a new thing? Or is it an incremental change on an existing thing? Those, and, and it happens, you know, when I was working at General Dynamics, we'd have, you know, a rocket and we'd then get a customer that wanted a little bit bigger rocket. So you add some solid rocket boosters or something, you change it a little bit. So not a drastic change in, in controls or trajectory. Um, if you're starting from scratch, obviously a whole nother ball of wax. Mm -hmm. um, another plug for controls um, as a specialty is that what I noticed both at Sandia and um, at General Dynamics was a lot of times the, the program managers were controls people. And the reason for that, I think, is that they have a pretty good understanding of all the bits because in order to do the controls, you kind of need to know where the sensors are, what they are, the actuation, the dynamic equations of the system, et cetera. So they're good candidates for, for program, you know, level um, engineering. So Bob wants to know, what, for what kind of ship did you design con crane control systems? Yeah, that's great. Um, it's called, the, it's a, there was a, a uh, maybe two or three. So one uh, category was the LMSR, um, Le, uh, I'm going to, I'll, I'll mumble the L part, but medium, you know, I don't know, it's a roll on roll off type uh, vessel with a bunch of cranes on it. The other was a tax, uh, the, um, the category of ship was a tax, a T-A-C-S. There's a lot of those running around. We worked primarily on the flicker tail state, which was a particular tax ship that was kind of designated as the ship that we could test control systems on. It had this really cool thing that they installed in the in the uh, you know uh, within the ship, and they could slosh water back and forth from one side of the ship to the other. I mean, this is a big ship, so you slosh this this massive amount of water from one side of the ship to the other, and you get the ship just to roll. So you could go out on calm seas and make the thing roll pretty vigorously, and we could use that to test our control strategies on. Another one is a more recent one. Um, uh, what's it called? Um, it's gone by a couple different names. I guess EPF is what it's called uh, currently. So expeditionary. So the acronym makes no sense because it's EPF, but it means expeditionary fast transport. Um, <laughs> I, I can't go there. Um, but that has a small uh, Appleton crane on the on the bow or on the um, stern, and it's a pretty cool ship. It's um, um, you know kind of like a uh, you know, pontoonish looking thing, but a big ship. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a few of them. Very good. And I, th I think we answered this, but I might be hallucinating. Um, in real world applications, do you use finite difference models rather than differential equations? Yeah. Yeah. So when we actually implement the control systems, it's all difference equations. You know, it, now, Again, you know, not to sound too fossilized or something, but, you know, in the old days, you know, you'd actually have to do a lot of that uh, work yourself. But now it's all completely automated and you can kind of not even worry about it because the, the processors are so fast that you don't have to get caught up in questions of, you know, loss of stability. Yeah, there's a little bit of that, but not as much as there used to be. Okay. And that question was from Michael A. So we, I think we've answered that. Oh. All right, and Thanks, so, <laughs> yeah, you, you might know him. I don't know. I probably do. <laughs> I try not to read people's last names unless I know that they are um, probably okay with it. So this next right. question is from Sarah. 
what are some of your favorite or coolest control systems you have um, been able gotten to work on? I love them all. It's like it's like which kid do you love the most? <laughs> um, I don't know. Let's see. Um, you know, the, so actually there was some stuff that Brad and I were doing, Brad King, several years ago on Coulomb control of spacecraft. Now, we didn't actually field any of those, you know, fly any, but it was really fun. Um, you know, just a, a really interesting concept that, that Brad came up with. And then, you know, he pulled me in as sort of a controls person to help, you know, with solving that problem. Um, very interesting. Basically, using the natural charging of, of objects in space as the actuation so that you could then form formations of charged spacecraft um, to do different, you know, types of missions. Um, we were working with some folks in different places around the country, maybe even overseas, and, and some of them picked it up and, and actually did some experiments, but no flight testing. So those were pretty fun. Yeah, yeah. cranes so, are always good. The, I love the, the kinds cranes. of things you start thinking about in the shower, and you're like, "Wow, I I, I love my job, right?" <laughs> yes, it's good. All right, um, let's see. We've answered that one. Are, uh, sometimes during rocket launches, you can hear during the flight that the control system has switched from open loop mm -hmm. to closed loop control, um, and I, I lost the end of that question. Hmm. I don't know where it went. Yeah, so I, I guess that would require some more digging because it, it sort of, I, I, I imagine it depends on what control system it is. Um, 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 so I, I guess I, I don't have a good answer for that one. Yeah. Okay. Um, and this next question is from one of our dear alumni, Alan. Hi, Alan. Um, <laughs> Alan says, I got through math at tech magna cum luck. I was an engineer for 30 <laughs> years. You can do it. <laughs> I agree with that. There you go. Yeah. Go to class, do all your homework, not just the first three, do all of them because that'll build your muscle memory and then you're able to do it in a panic situation during a test because you've already made all the mistakes at home. So go to class, do all your homework. That's my advice. Um, uh, all right, you know, go ahead. Just one, one comment on that. I didn't mention this in my little introduction and I sort of meant to, but you know, I, I really wasn't on, in high school. I wasn't on the, uh, the college track, if you will, but I didn't go to college right away. Um, so I, I guess I'd look at that experience and say, you know, life takes you in funny places, perhaps. I think most of them are almost all of them good. Um, and, you know, I, I believe you could do it, I guess. I'll just leave it yeah. at that. I think it's right. Fun. And guess what? If you don't pass the class the first time, you take it again. And you, and you, just, yeah. you go for more help, you work harder, you know, and sometimes you've got to backfill some holes. Um, uh, and, uh, yeah. But uh, I, I'm a big fan. There's an online math learning system called Alex, which is A-L-E-K-S dot com. So Alex dot com. So if you want to brush up on your, your pre-calculus before coming back, you know what? Um, you know, 15 hours of review is probably worth, you know, $10,000 because it'll it's kind of will move you from a grade of B in the math class to a grade of A because it puts all that stuff just back up in the frontal lobe or wherever it needs to be so that you can access it quickly. Um, all right, this is a good question from Cameron. So in the vertical rod demo, what happens if you push on the rod from the axis at right angles to the direction of motion Ooh. of the control motor? Can you compensate right. for that motion? Um, I can't compensate for that motion but um, I'm just going to swing this around. Do they, do, they just... mean push, do they mean push at it from this? I don't mean, no, quite know what they mean. So I'm, I'm assuming you mean push on it like in this direction. Because oh, yeah, it yeah. wants to go in this direction. And um, you can see that there's some little compliance with the cart and, and the track back here. And it actually bends. There's absolutely no way to um, uh, compensate for that. If I just gave it a poke like that, it'd probably be okay. Um, but it would only be because 
the springiness of the cart and the track keep it from going berserk. So there's nothing Got I it. could do to control that. Yeah. Yep. All right, this next question is from Akash Raj. Um, Dr. Parker, do you think that uh -huh. advanced controls algorithm like MPC LQG should mm -hmm. be made part of the curriculum? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> More alphabet. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I assume you're referring to the sort of the controls thread of things. Um, um, you know, we touch on LQG in the graduate level controls, multivariable controls, 5715, that's both um, taught in double uh, E, ME, sort of a combined class. MPC, we don't, and we probably should. Wayne Weaver and I have been, you know, talking, we, we have this conversation all the time about firing off an optimal control class, and that's where MPC would, would really fit nicely. A lot of my students work with MPC, but we have to, um, you know, get up to speed on that individually, and that's not always the best. So, yes, yeah, yeah, we should. Oh, gosh, and we've got 63 attendees at 7.21 p.m., and it's coming up on Jeopardy. So we've got to get through the last few as quickly oh, as possible. No. So Kay um, asks, are subway systems using this sort of technology in order to decrease the jolting associated with starting and stopping? Oh, great question. So I love, it's sort of, it, we, one way to call it is command shaping. And that's kind of what you saw with the, with the swing, the swing free thing is, you know, you look at the dynamics of the system and you exploit them and then come up with a smooth profile. Um, I, I, I have to believe they are. If they're not, you and me should get together and we could probably make a, a small fortune on that because we could, we could come up with some pretty good strategies for mitigating um, uh, bad motion. I don't know a whole lot about subways, but, um, <laughs> you know, I think that would be good if they're not doing it. They should. Mm -hmm. All right, and I think I I think I've, we've answered that one. Um, so, um, how does a controller implementation using embedded low-level language differ from using a model-based tool like Simulink? Mm -hmm. Well, um, so what happens with Simulink? You know, when when Sal was hitting the build button, it actually so Simulink is this block diagram looking you know, way of, of, of analyzing and working with a control system and simulation and a dynamic system. So the block diagram is kind of like what I had drawn on the, on the big poster board thingies. Um, so what happens when you hit build is the software looks at that model and actually creates a piece of C code that it then compiles and then downloads the microprocessor. You can certainly write that piece of C code yourself. Um, uh, but the nice thing about using something like Simulink is that if you want to modify the controller, you just drop in some other element into the model and hit build and it's good. If I were to code it myself and I've done that, I, you know, I make a mistake, I have bugs, I got to debug it and all this kind of stuff. That's all been done in, in Simulink. So I'm kind of a huge fan of that approach from a quality standpoint. Very good. All right, I think we're getting close to the end here. So this is from Jacob. Have you ever done work using Python for control system implementation in cases where MATLAB Simulink was not an option? Or has your work of right. that type primarily been done using C, C++? Right, primarily C and a little bit of C++, now that you mention it, um, and ADA for some spacecraft stuff. Um, the, um, so, so, not Python for implementation, though I am curious about that. More from an analysis standpoint, definitely yes, there are some, um, you know, some backfill needs there. I mean, you know, I don't want to sound like a, uh, yeah, I'll just leave it at that, yeah. All right, and this is from Jeff. Um, can you elaborate on the importance of your co-op experience to your career success? Oh, yeah, so let's see. Um, my co-op experience was all with Eaton Corporation in southeastern Michigan. And I learned how to write 
there. I mean, I'm not saying I'm a good writer or anything, but, but, but I improved my writing skill dramatically um, by being there. Um, so that was great. Um, because you had to write reports? Right, exactly. Yeah. And, um, you know, sticking with it for more than just one crack was helpful because, you know, coming back, then, you know, you get more responsibility and, and those sorts of things. So you get sort of deeper into the projects. At least that was my experience. Um, I, I, you know, honestly, when I came back to, to school each time, I just had a different view of things. You know, I, I think a more realistic view of things. And um, uh, so it was good. I, I strongly recommend, you know, interning, co-oping, all that kind of stuff. Um, and and it, it, for the, those of you who may not know, co-op is when you take an entire semester and you spend it at a company doing a job that they've you know, you know, and you've got a supervisor and the whole thing, and then you earn all that money and then you come back and it kind of helps pay your way through school. And it also helps you figure out, do I really want to be a chemical engineer? Do I really want to be a mechanical engineer? And it also helps you figure out, um, and the company figure out if they want to offer you a full-time job or if you might want to work for the company um, full-time when you graduate. It's, there's all kinds of advantages to it. And so it's a real compliment to you that you were offered, um, you know, renewed co-op experiences with the same company. Yeah, got away with one there. You know. <laughs> so this question is from Atharva, who is a future master's student from India who has deferred his admit to next fall um, because of the issues with the travel visas and things. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so Atharva is interested in specializing in robotics in his career, um, but doesn't know and has a little knowledge in that space. Um, so they would like some advice on what they should do um, this, this next year in advancing their skills. What kinds of things should they focus on learning before coming to Michigan Tech? And they are just now graduating with their bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. Hmm. Wow. Ay, ay, ay. That, I, I, that's a... Um... That's a lot of responsibility on me if I say the wrong thing, you know. <laughs> I picked the. I saved that to the yeah. end because it's like big question, isn't right. it? Right, it's deep. Um, I, you know, I would say anything that. Well, let's see, robotics. So, um, um. Okay, so it sort of depends on what side of robotics you want to be on. There's the the. Um, you know, programmers or, you know, cell development, which is really interesting and, and quite sophisticated. You can almost see this dance of robots, right, to, to make something happen. So there are things like optimization, um, kinematics, um, and so on. If you're more on the development side of robotics, then you probably have to get into the, the dynamics side of things pretty deeply. Um, but, you know, I, I would say anything in that space of controls and, um, you know, even certainly electrical uh, concepts and electrical engineering, any of those things would be helpful. You know, you won't go wrong, no doubt. Mm -hmm. I'm always going to say um, controls. Yeah, I know. Control is the answer, apparently. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. all right. I, and this will be our very, very last question. It's from Benjamin. Um, um, whose roommate would like to know how the sky is looking out over the portage. So I was looking out the window. I, can, I see slightly cloudy. I could see some blue sky and white clouds. It's a lovely it's day here. It's always blue, Ben. It's always it, was, blue. it was so cold last night, or the night before last, that I had to close my window and put a blanket on. It was like 55 or something. It was... No, it's it's and, it's lovely, cool, and we don't, we're not having a hurricane or a you know all that nasty rain that's about to hit the east coast. It's very lovely up no, here. and, and Come the visit turtles us. are sunning themselves on the logs, and this is beautiful. <laughs> I saw a um oh gosh, what was it? The yellow birds? What are they called? The ones that are yellow with black? Finch. The finches? No, an American. Dang it! I I posted it on my um. Oh, I can never remember the names of birds. I had to look it up. I'm like, it's a yellow and black bird. What is it? It may have been a oh, Oriole? That's real. Mm, nah. I'd have to, yeah. you have to go, go, go to Oriole. my, um, yeah. And so, so anyway, I want to wrap it up. Um, we have no more open questions. Uh, Dr. Gordon Parker, thank you so much. It's been wonderful spending the evening with you. Nice rally with fixing the equipment and, you know, the sound.
and in the internet connection and everything. Um, thank we you, audience. It. It's been wonderful hanging out with you. And we're starting back up September 14th. Um, if I cannot um, send a mask to you if you are currently employed at the university. So if you're a student at the university, if you're a if you're a grad student at the university, I can't really send you a mask. But if you're an alumnus or a friend of Michigan Tech, feel free to send me an email, Callahan at mtu.edu. I'm happy to send you one. And everyone is going to get something who's attended even once. Um, we, we just and we we just want you to help promote Michigan Tech. It's an amazing university, and um, you know we welcome having a, as many people as want to join us for Husky Bites this fall, starting back up on September 14th. And thank you again, Bill Predabon, Chair of Mechanical, for being the sponsor this evening. All right. Good night, everyone. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Gordon. Yeah, bye -bye. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, Brian.